yours and keep to right love. He's real. Free. Ready or not, Freddy's back. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 3. Dream Warriors, rated R. Starts Friday at a theater near you. You look, it's picking up great, dude. You sound really good. You enormous sound... bulbous. <laughs> you you don't like bulbous things yeah. in your face like that? It's like <laughs> nightmares. Speaking like of. night, Like dream warriors. Yeah. Penis. How many times are we going to refer to the penis, Freddy? Probably quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hope It's so. unavoidable. Or, or just the one time in the one scene that it occurs. No, no, no. <laughs> well, we've already mentioned it twice, just prior to even recording. The or Freddy pre-gaming. penis is something that should be discussed, uh, you know, 30, 40 years later. It's definitely, definitely a, a big deal. All right. Let's do <laughs> it. <intended. laughs> exactly. It's a rock hard, a solid start. Shocktober returns at Reconsidimation. I am John Diner. I'm David Munchak. I'm Brent Hutchins. And this is the podcast that takes a look back at some of our favorite films from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And we've got a huge one. It's David's favorite time of year. It's like Christmas for David, right? Absolutely. (laughs) And uh, we couldn't get it kickstarted without having one of our dearest, closest, most personal, longtime friends uh, come back to the show. It's E.K. Wimmer from Laser Graves. Welcome back, buddy. All right, hey E.K. Hey. Yeah. hey, I just entered the chat like a giant phallic Freddy. <laughs> Let's get it started soon. Let's, right. right off the bat. You're clawing your way out of it. That's uh, Everyone can picture that right into the oh. recording booth here. Hi. Oh boy! So it's been a it's been a minute. So uh, the last time we had you on the show was for I think uh, when we look back at the thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was yeah. a fun episode. Yeah, that was an epic. Uh, that was like a three hour plus, I think, extravaganza. But uh, but God, you've been on the show multiple times. We looked at uh, back at Canon Films. We looked back at our our hundredth episode special, Assault on Precinct Thirteen. But you also joined us about a year ago to look back at A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. So we figured it was, of course, time to continue the trend. Yeah, I'm excited to see everybody's thoughts on this because we had such an in-depth conversation about Part 2. I don't know if there is as much to be found below the surface in Part 3, but I am interested to see everybody's thoughts on the continuation of this franchise because it's fun when you can keep a, a dialogue going over a long period of time when everybody's got a good, um, you know, base knowledge of the topic versus it being, you know, first time for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot to bite off on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, which we're here to talk about today. Uh, let's see. So, but before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on with Laser Graves and any of your other projects? What do you have going on? Um, Yeah, we've been, we took a little break uh, just for kind of regroup at Christmas time and took a few months off and then came back and then we got right back to it. We, we dropped our Patreon because we just couldn't keep up with that. That's what was really bogging us down and, but then went back to our normal schedule of two episodes a month and just released our most recent one uh, was a deep dive on the PMRC Senate hearing trials with, um, you know, Dee Snyder, Twisted Sister, and Tipper Gore trying to get music censored in 1984, 95. And that was a really fun one. We've been talking about wanting to do that for quite a long time. And, wow. and we just did that one. That's uh, that's a heavy topic right there. Yeah, well, we were going to do it as part of a larger Satanic Panic, you know, episode. But it's that topic by itself is so interesting that we figured let's just break off and do it, you know, an episode on just that. So yeah, we've been busy. We're just getting back into the swing of things and then on my own, just staying busy with music and film and, you know, just as always, never, never any rest. Never a dull moment. 
No. Um, quick plug for your Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome episode. I thought that was uh, fantastic. So Ooh. everybody check that out. But okay, so on to our, our current subject. Uh, we are continuing our dive through the Nightmare on Elm Street series. You can check out our archives at reconsideration.com for a look back at part one and part two from last year. But here we go. Uh, David, fire out a the quickest plot summary that, that you got. What What is happening? What What is Freddy Krueger up to now? Well, uh, you know, the movie, you know, it's about a psychiatrist familiar with the knife-wielding dream demon Freddy Krueger. Uh, and, and, and they help teens at a mental hospital battle the killers invading their dreams. That's, that's pretty, pretty quick. Good. Yeah, yeah that's a yeah. good job. That's that about plot. sums it up. It's a plot yeah. synopsis. Yeah. Well done. So, yeah, this is uh, where do we leave off for part two? So, well, actually, you know what? Before we get to that, let's circle back with when was the first time you guys heard about Nightmare on Elm Street 3 or saw it? Did, did you did you catch it on video? I doubt any of us saw it in the theater. Brent, why don't we start with you? Would you see it on video? Uh, yeah, certainly saw it on video. This is actually one of this was the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie i owned on vhs and so i watched this movie over and over and over again <laughs> as yeah. a kid but i don't think i mean this came out in what 80 89 87 right yeah. so i didn't get it straight out but but once my parents finally let the let let me start purchasing vhs's of my own uh, accord like this was one of the first ones I got and so I I probably saw this on HBO prior to it uh to me owning it but this one was one of the ones you know like this movie was right in my wheelhouse seeing Fangoria seeing you know this VHS like over and over again so um yeah, I don't know exactly the precise moment I saw it. I definitely do not have like a ticket stub with this on it, but uh, but I remember seeing it so many times as a kid over and over again. Did we see, did we at some point in college and in, in, back in Santa Fe, did we see a midnight screening of this together? I feel like I remember a hazy memory. Like of, in a theater or? Like at the uh, Jean Cocteau Theater, which is now uh, run by uh, George R. R. Martin. I did not. I was not part of that. No. Okay. If I was, I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. I barely it, may remember. Mean, it may mean that I was there. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. <laughs> what about you, EK? When, when did this hit your radar? Uh, pretty early on. I, it was actually the fourth um, nightmare film I had seen. So I think part two was the first one I saw. And then part four, as I probably mentioned when we did the part two episode was still to date my favorite one because I had that in part two on VHS as a kid and I watched part four I mean weekly like probably the only movie I've seen more than than part four is uh, the Goonies and and then I saw part one so I didn't get to part three until maybe uh early you know like 12 13 somewhere around mm -hmm. there probably and then once I saw it I really loved it but I think it's one of those interesting cases, and we'll we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, where part three tends to be a lot of fan favorite. That's the, the episode that a lot of people like, but yeah. because I was already, you know, well versed in part four, um, I didn't have that maybe nostalgia tied to three like everybody else, which seems to irritate a lot of people. Like it's <laughs> blasphemy to say four is better to me, but I did have and still do because it wouldn't be appropriate to be on this podcast without showing oh. the old VHS. Oh, there that's it is. Awesome. Wow. And there's the old Dokken sticker right there. Yeah. Nice. Warriors as seen on MTV. Wow. So yeah, once I had this, all bets were off, you know, and I had the first four on VHS pretty early on. So that's why I know those ones the best. So yeah, I'd say probably 13 at the latest is when mm -hmm. I finally got to see part three. I have similar, I have similar feelings about four, uh, to you ek i i also part four is one of my favorites and i think it's because at the same time i don't know if it was part of the vhs release or not but there was like a behind the scenes making of yeah. that was like v mind-blowing to me as 
as a kid watching it and and really seeing like how they crafted the effects in that one like i think really uh made me like that movie quite a bit mm -hmm. yeah there is a making of and i like to to make a little distinction here is part four is my favorite that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best one Understood. there's a different yeah. there's a difference yeah, yeah. there well i, th I think so, that's part i feel of, similar yeah. yeah that's part of the thing with this whole franchise is that it's really it's kind of all over the i mean yes yeah. the majority have one or the other as their favorite but you'll find a lot of people who like four who like two who like seven now um which you know it, it's all over but uh david how about you when did you first uh catch nightmare three i don't know it was a number of years back um i remember a lot of sequences from this and uh pro most mostly the ending uh climax last 20 minutes of it T couldn't tell you when probably saw it over a friend's house so i probably i think i might have even seen most of the movie but the only thing that's indelible that like just i remember was those last like 20 minutes um uh, I was probably bored by the rest of the movie at the time, but, um, um, but yeah, no, yeah. So I don't know, long, long time ago as a teen or a kid, I might've been a kid. My, my friends always had this shit on the <laughs> around. So like, and you were just, you were there while it was, uh, while it was playing. Yeah. Glued, yeah, yeah. glued to the TV like <laughs> on the edge of your seat, waiting for the next creatively disgusting and grotesque murder scene. <laughs> yeah so right? uh, yeah so yeah the first time was way way back in the probably the late 80s early 90s and then um yeah and then yeah that's 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 back then interesting uh i kind of the first time i knew of this movie was that i had i i subscribed to cracked magazine cracked and mad magazines and there was a whole you know they like every new movie that was coming out they would do some kind of spoof of it. And I remember reading, you know, seeing the Nightmare on Elm Street 3 one with the phallic uh, Freddy worm penis monster. You know, there was a whole thing about that. And yeah. it's the best scene. <laughs> it's, it is quite a scene. I'm uh, keeping the phallic Freddy count right now and we're at two already. We're at two. Yeah. yeah. And not even counting uh, us, our pre record discussion. <laughs> yeah. No, but, that doesn't uh, count. We'll come back to that one uh, in a few minutes. There's <laughs> there's something about the fact that you guys keep bringing it up that that intrigues yeah. me more than the yeah. rest, the other, anyone. Yeah. Otherwise, it's gonna be it's gonna be our new mascot. That's that's what. It is. <laughs> t shirts coming soon, guys. Exactly. Yeah. that's why we're kicking off our Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that crack magazine was the first time I kind of knew about it. Then I started seeing the trailers for it and, and paying attention to it when I, I think the first time I saw it probably was like, had to be 89, 90 on VHS, but definitely the scene with, with the, the nurse, uh, character was a very, very much an awakening to sexuality for me as a youngster. Uh, and I think, I think a lot of people kind of recall that scene or that moment, you know, as a kid, um, and I had the first three on VHS. So, and I think I got it like one, I think I got it in order, one, two, and then three. Um, but then when they, the, the big DVD set came out and like, I want to say 99, that really cool box set that had the, the great artwork on the side. Uh, then I got really into the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And then I kind of cycled out of the Nightmare movies. I think I got rid of everything, but the first one, I was like, oh, they're they're all terrible. I don't. I, and now I love them again. So, <laughs> I like as, as a theme with me, it, it comes regrets. full circle. Yeah, it's regrets right there. Getting rid of that. Yeah, yeah. I have a follow up question with not just the first time you guys saw it, but you know when David was talking about seeing it way back too. Is interestingly, when was the last time you saw it prior to recording this episode? Because that's. That's been interesting to me when, you know, when we do these podcasts is, yes, maybe I saw it back in the day, but some of these movies I never saw again until I have to see it to do an episode on it. And it's interesting to see how your thoughts changed over a very long passage of time, which is the whole point of this podcast. But it's just interesting in this case where all three or all four of us hasn't, this hasn't always been the case, but all four of us already had seen this film prior to this episode back yeah. in the day. I'm just curious who's who's seen it more recently. You know, 
Has anybody revisited this over the years or is it like a one-time thing? I'll say I can almost guarantee the last time I saw this was probably with John when he had his box set in college. Like I'll, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen it since, since, since then. Yeah. I, I think that may have been like, I've had, I had it for a really long time, but I think that was the last time I actually watched it. So somewhere, somewhere in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, late, late, early nineties was the last time I saw it. Yeah. So it's going to been a good chunk of time then. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the interesting thing about, you know, part of what we do here is, is, thinking about what we thought about the movie back then, whether we saw it or heard about it, what we knew about it versus now, you know, do we think about it the same way? How has, how has time kind of changed the movie or how maybe it hasn't. Um, so that's kind of, I, I mean, speaking of that, so what do you guys think the street cred of nightmare three is today? I mean, our modern audiences, you think still familiar with it or, has has the whole Freddy franchise kind of like gone to the wayside? I think three is the one that rose up as the champion of the whole franchise. I think whether people are really familiar with it or not, they won't admit that, but they'll definitely say, uh, if you ask the average person, what's your favorite one of the franchise, almost unanimously, it goes to number three. And that may be just because there's some really iconic deaths in this and um, it's a safe bet to say part three is your favorite one because you don't have to explain yourself if you say mm -hmm. any other one but part three. Right. But I would say, if anything, at least as far as the horror community goes, as the years go on, three becomes even more solidified as like the definitive Nightmare on Elm Street film. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with that. I think I think this movie is the one that kind of solidified Freddy as a pop culture kind of icon that really catapulted the franchise to be able to make, you know, four more, four more movies or, or however many they made. I think it's four with, with the addition of Freddy versus Jason. So, so with, I think, you know, this is the first one where really the name Freddy gets used, you know, continuously, like from this point forward, he's known as Freddy, not Fred Krueger. Like he's Freddy. He's the one that starts, like using the pop, like kind of the glib pop culture one-liners, like welcome to prime time, bitch. Like that right there is like a calling card and awakening to him being like this, this big pop culture icon. Yeah, and so that, like, I think that moment is huge. Yeah, it is. It is exactly the, the moment where it, where it yeah. happens. Right. And yeah. so it's like, I don't think you have, I mean, and we can, I think we're going to talk about this, you know, obviously the first movie was, was really well received a great horror movie like just a, a a very unique spin on on the genre during a time when you know there were a bunch of these kind of slasher um you know creep in the woods type type horror movies coming on like it was a new take the second movie although it did well at the box office like kind of departed from that fantasy kind of realm of this this character being able to attack you in their dreams and then and you know i think that part two has a lot of um i think there are a lot of fans of part two but i think that it's a departure from from what the first one was and what they came back to that kind of made it you know what gave it its longevity and this this one like really reintroduced it to that to that thing developed more aspects of it and then started to you know add some more humor kind of depart away from like the like the actual horror horror component and just you know it was like great kills great one-liners like the they really focus on freddy as a character and like the driving part of of you know the franchise at this point like absolutely like i think that this one kind of withstands the test because because it laid everything out for the rest of it well, and like this one is uh, so it's so impactful. And I know we're going to talk about why it's impactful for the franchise and everything. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we all know that nursery rhyme one, two, buckle my shoe or whatever. But like, I know the Freddy version more so than that. Like as a kid, mm -hmm. I knew it. Right. And I didn't really see the like other than seeing the movie at the time, I wasn't quoting the movie. Like my friends all knew that shit. We all taught. We all said the Freddy version of that nursery rhyme where he's coming for you, you know, like, um, 
so like that 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 like so watching it in the beginning of this film uh, i was like oh yeah like i actually know this almost by heart like the whole the 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 new lyrics for the the freddy version you know i um, still know it by heart but... yeah yeah <laughs> so like uh and and you know and and that's the and taking it from like a tri- you know a nursery rhyme song or whatever helps that help implant it in your brain but it's uh I definitely knew the Freddy one without having to see the movie a bunch of times. Like all of my friends knew it. Yeah, this is, this is really the turning point and sort of the, you know, rebirth of the franchise that was financially successful up to this point, but it was unknown, you know, where, what direction they were really going in. And this is that perfect mix of horror and, um you know that mtv version of freddy that he would become definitely in part four and part five but this is the real creation of that and and mixing of pop culture with this horror you know icon at the time uh which you know so this you're right you guys are right this this is the one that the majority of people will point to as as the definitive freddy in nightmare on elm street film but it depends on what freddy you prefer if you like the darker scarier horror version of freddy then you're gonna probably lean towards one two maybe seven or there's this freddy who you get in three four five and six yeah you know when we're talking about what did this movie do for the the legacy of freddy why i think it's a safe assumption to say three is the the quintessential one is because when you have a franchise this large you can watch any of them. And if you don't like it, somebody will say, well, watch part three. Like that's the go-to. If you, maybe I didn't like part six. Well, that's because you haven't seen part three yet. Like Mm -hmm. that's the, that's the, the one that everybody goes back to. So I would say in general, if you don't like part three, you probably don't like the franchise as a whole. Whereas you can not like some of the other ones and still like part three, if that makes sense. Like, that's why I think part three is is the touchstone of the whole franchise because mm-hmm. that's the one that everybody keeps pointing back to. Give that one a try. You know, I tried New Nightmare. Well, you haven't seen part three. You got to try that. Like that's yeah. always the conversation. And that to me is the indication that three really is kind of the poster child. Yeah, well, I mean, three gets back to defining what Freddy, you know, who Freddy is, what he can and can't do, the rules of reality versus the dream world. And we get, you know, more deeper into that in, in the middle and later films. But this resets that because it's set up in the first film, abandoned in the second film, where he's really just a body snatcher trying to come back to life through someone's body rather than attack, you know, attacking through the dreams and, and through that state of mind. And this one is completely focused on the remaining, you know, I guess the final um, kids of the, uh, the, Elm, the Elm Street kids, right? That are the last mm-hmm. surviving Elm Street kids who are all in this asylum really <laughs> where they uh, are, you know, patients and, and all having mental health issues and trying to get over depression and, and, uh, you know, somewhat psychotic issues where we find Nancy, our, our heroine from the first film is suddenly, we don't know how she's, she's got her doctorate. And, uh, oh, yeah. she, isn't, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> I thought she was an intern. But she's okay. not, yeah, she's she, not quite. She, yeah, she is an intern, but. She's still like 20. Yeah. It was, I had to, I had to do the math myself because I looked up the age difference between her and Patricia Arquette in real life. And it's, it's four years. And then at some point she says, six years ago, this is what happened. I'm like, how in the world did you get to this position in six years? Because I was still like drugging through undergrad at that point. Yeah. Like, that was good for uh, her. <laughs> uh, the go-getter. So yeah, it's interesting. We'll talk more about the the characters and, and bringing the Nancy character back and kind of, I think the differences with the portrayal of that character in this movie versus the first movie and then in later incarnations. But um, yeah, what, so Nightmare on Elm Street 2, let's, let's kind of recap that real fast. 
definitely abandoning you know Wes Craven is not as involved in that movie goes a totally different direction we have you know no characters uh, returning except Freddie and even Fred even they even tried to replace Robert England in part two and very quickly realized if you can find that one shot in the movie without him playing Freddie uh, yeah. that you absolutely he is Freddy Krueger and you have to have him a part of it and he has to play that character so getting him back involved and trying to steer the ship back to where it was when the first film ended. Um, because I think it just, if I don't know where they were going to go after, after part two. Yeah. I think what made this choice to go back, like return to form really smart is that what made Freddie unique is that he could control the dream world. And in part two, it's like he became bored with that and wanted to manifest in a physical form in the real world. So it's it's kind of taking away the, the one thing that separated Freddy from all the other cut and paste horrors of the time. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to, you know, to make it contemporary with Sandman. Like you have to have your character work within their own realm that they control. And so what I do like is not only do they return, but they go full into... Not only is Freddie back in the dreamland, but he's all about it now. Like this is his place and he loves it and he thrives in it again. And by doing that, it reminds everybody that, yes, yeah, sure, he might get these daydreams sometimes of taking over a teenager's body and, and turning into a human. But really where he's at his best and has his most fun is when he fully commits to just being the master of, of the nightmares. And that's what I think works really well with this is it reminds everybody of what made Freddie unique to begin with. Yeah. Well, and, and in two, the house was sort of the conduit, right, for him to come through. Well, he was using sort of the house as like his doorway, right. whereas here that like that's totally gone. It's just just back to dreams and it can be anywhere at any time, uh, which is so so much more. There's just so much more creativity to it. And, and especially think back to 1987, where is the other horror icons of the 80s? Where is Jason and where is Michael Myers at this point? Right. Michael mm -hmm. Myers is nowhere to be found. He was, you know, knocked off after the second movie. And, and I think at this point they were probably gearing up for the fourth film and bringing him back, but he wasn't around. And Jason, uh, we're not quite on our Friday the 13th films. We're just getting close to 87, but um, Jason at this point has taken a, a, a turn, you know, definitely is over the hill and is on the down sli slide of uh of that franchise so you know the slasher genre had been had been just over so overdone at that point but freddy well and the and that, mpaa had come in and kind of right. like killed a lot of that you know and yeah. what's interesting here is like in in, in the nightmare on elm street movies like they kind of got away with some things that those other slasher shows or movies couldn't because it's in the kind of dream and or fantasy realm, right? So they're still able to kind of be a little bit more gory and and paint it up as like fantasy, mm -hmm. uh, you know? And so I think they get away with a little bit more than than some of those others could during this specific time time frame. Yeah, I mean, it just just the what the the gag really that comes with freddy is is it's so separate from reality so it's not just a guy running around with a knife or an axe or whatever just slashing people like this is n not purposely not rooted in reality so you could you could get away with more and they could it, I, they had a little more give with the mpa because it's not a reality that the same reality we're talking about yeah, and speaking of the reality, another thing that they started to introduce in this one that set the template for all the rest after this is up until this one, you didn't have that questionable, are they dreaming, are they not dreaming, as subtle as it becomes in part three. In part three, it gets to the point where you have to be watching if they're even blinking their eyes now, or you know, a single blink could have been the indication that they're now dreaming, which yeah. they play up big time in part four. So this is kind of that other aspect of it makes it almost interactive as a viewer that it wasn't in part two, where when you're watching it, you go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Are they actually asleep or are they not asleep? And it can be the matter of a split second. And if you didn't catch it, you're, you're in for a ride. 
that became a standard in nightmare films after that was this playfulness of we're going to get you you're you're not going to quite know when they're dreaming until it's crazy and that hadn't existed yet and i think so there's a lot of groundwork laid in part 3 that became the blueprint you know it didn't start the franchise over but it really solidified what the franchise had to be to go forward and be successful yeah i mean it definitely it got it, ba it back on its feet yeah um and of course you know there was nobody better to do that than to bring Wes Craven back into the franchise. And while he didn't direct this film, I think he, he, you know, was one of the writers was one of the producers involved with kind of getting it back to more of what it, the direction it should have been going. But it's interesting in researching this, hearing all the different script versions that were kind of floating out there. Like I, I had not realized that, John Saxon, who plays uh, yeah. Lieutenant Thompson, wrote yeah. a draft of a script, and Robert England wrote a draft. Like yeah. everybody, it's like everybody was asked to write a draft for this. Yeah, I, John. So John Saxon wrote wrote a uh, who I love, by the way. I love John Saxon. I mean, he's a big. Yeah. I know he's a big like Tarantino kind of guy, but um, just always a cool actor and uh, in a lot of cult movies through the seventies, but. Uh, I always knew him as Lieutenant Thompson. He, that's who he was for me. So, uh, but I, I can't believe he wrote a script, which was really the origin story. Mm -hmm. It was the whole backstory yeah. of, of Freddie with the parents and, and what happened, um, which I think was, I believe his version also had Freddie as sort of being set up and as being more of uh, not, not being guilty of what he was being accused of. Which is yeah, what, I don't know. If, I don't. I don't know if I like that idea. I, well, didn't they do that with the remake? Yeah. Even well, they tried. Well, they kind of leaned into the whole child predator side, though. Mm -hmm. It just it made him more of a victim, even though he was guilty of it. I mean, it was a really right. confusing tone. I wasn't sure what they were. I mean, that's another whole podcast to get into that remake. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a problem, but it is interesting. This is also the first time where Freddie starts to almost become a hero, like we're we're having fun with him now. And that's a, a, it's a weird twist where you're not quite rooting for, but you you look forward to the villain at being on screen and terrorizing children. Yeah. It's really a weird uh, approach to filmmaking that was wildly successful. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way he's doing these kills that he becomes the guy you're rooting for. Like it all happens within this movies and we don't, or with this, within this particular movie. And I don't think we dislike the Elm Street kids in this movie. Right. Do we, what do you guys think? No, not at all. Yeah, they're, they're not unlikable, but you just kind of like Freddie more because he's, but identifiable and he's cool and he's funny and he's cracking these what these great one-liners yeah, as he's he brings them. he brings the entertainment value you right. know what i mean like it's i mean every scene he's in is this you know like it's it's a cleverly delivered one-line humorous scene followed by some sort of elaborate out of the box you know kill and yeah. i think that you know for fans of the franchise like you know that's it those are the exciting moments you know like those are the moments that are that are kind of fun and that you're 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 kind of waiting for the next one exactly i mean you think about 1987 this is coming out you know the the average age of the people seeing this are teenagers right mtv is what MTV came out, I know in the early 80s, but by this point, it's really start, starting to hit its peak. And the fact that, you know, you combine it with a great band like Dokken with a <laughs> great song <laughs> that's all over MTV and Freddie being in that video all over MTV, just really hammering it home to that audience. Like, of course, they're going to they're gonna love this guy. And you didn't get that with the other heart, even though... Uh, for Friday the 13th Part 6, you had Alice Cooper really involved, but you didn't get that same MTV integration that you did with this one. And then Freddy is just, you know, pop culture icon uh, for the late 80s, you know, especially through Part 4 and 5 as well. 
Yeah, I think why people started rooting starting in, in part three is because part two didn't give you those really clever creative kills that the second you saw it, you were like, what in the hell? I want to see another one because in this one, the very first one you get is this incredibly cool stop motion puppetry. You know, he's, it's so gruesome. It's the, the one that really stood out as a kid. I had never seen anything like this in my life to be a human puppet like that. And if that's going to set the tone, and we'll get into that more in detail, but what I'm saying is that sets the tone for part three of the first kill. And you're like, man, if it's this crazy, I can't wait to see him kill another kid. Yeah, Whereas right. with part part two, you didn't get that. It was Part two was intense and it was scary, but it didn't have that wow factor of you're just itching to see what he's going to do next in the way that part three did. And that's the legacy that, again, continues into part four and five is that once you know you're in a dream sequence, the bar has been set that it better be a pretty creative kill because it's a dream kill. It's not a normal kill. And that's what makes it fun is like once we're dreaming, that means we're, it's going to get it's going to get wild. Yeah. Anything can happen. Yeah. So Robert in England writes a script that's kind of about Tina's Tina, which is Amanda Wiss's character from the first film. Her older sister comes back to, to get revenge or something, and that gets really bizarre and sort of off track. But Wes Craven's script was actually what became New Nightmare, the seventh film. Right. So that kind of very meta. meta. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's about the actors playing the characters. So, um, you know, New Line was not into that idea. And I think they were probably right at the time. I think that was in 87. I don't think we were into meta stuff at, at that point in time. So even well, in the 90... film hadn't the film hadn't yeah. been addressed that much. Like Freddie needed to be the pop icon in order for the meta idea to work. Right. And you only Absolutely. had two films and you didn't even know who Freddie really was yet as a character trying to already introduce some meta version of freddy like people didn't even know who he was to begin with at this right. point so yeah you had to be six films deep before you could start playing on your own legacy for it to work so it was a smart choice to wait it, it would yeah. have failed miserably had they tried this earlier yeah and it took the i think the failure of five and six ultimately to kind of drive it back in that direction that why not why not try that version? And at the time it didn't really work, but you know, two years after that, he makes scream, which is also, you know, a, a masterpiece of meta ness. <laughs> um, but so they find new line finds Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont and Frank was, I didn't really have too much of a track record prior to this, but uh, Chuck Russell had directed dreams or wrote dreamscape which was, I think, 1985 or 86. So, you know, why not keep him in the dream world and yeah. uh, bring him over for... for Dreamscape. Uh, yeah, for dream Not the one of my favorites from childhood. I barely remember that. Uh, it's good. You yeah. should check it out. But, Rewatch. But he saw the, you know, priority of getting Freddie back on track like we've been talking about. So, you know, clearly he was the right choice. And, and it sounded like he was a... Um, that Chuck Russell was a tough, tough director for the actors that he put, you know, he worked him pretty hard and put him through some, you know, a lot of physical stuff that, uh, you know, maybe they weren't prepped for. And I think they worked like a, at least one, like almost 24 hour day, which, you, you know, you don't do that now. You can't do that now. But back then you could kind of get away with it. Mm -hmm. so, and a lot of yeah. these, these were their first films too, yeah. like. All our ones that really went on to have a good career, most of them, this was their very first feature film. So you could get away with kind of pushing these kids a little bit more than than a seasoned actor would allow. And I think that's what also started creating just an uncomfortable set environment is that right. you have a, a really strained budget with a script that was written for a way bigger budget and they're trying to compromise and and it's just, it's a perfect storm. I'm glad that they were able to get through it though. And it didn't just implode in on itself. Yeah, I yeah mean, I, well, I'll, I'll go ahead, Brent. Oh, I was just gonna say, I read one story about the making of this where, you know, Patricia Arquette's like first night of shooting, they 
didn't even start shooting until about four in the morning. And like, she was exhausted and couldn't remember her lines. And it was just like this really, you know, terrible environment to, to get your first like scenes in, you know? And so, uh, sounds pretty brutal, but. Well, and she doesn't, you know, uh, yeah. Patricia Arquette being the, basically the lead of the film, really the lead Elm street kid. And, uh, a character that would go on, you know, to, to future films in the franchise, but not with Patricia Arquette playing her. Um, you know, she doesn't really, you don't see her talk a lot about this movie. She's acknowledged it a couple of times that, you know, it exists and she was in it and she worked with Lawrence Fishburne, but that's, that's kind of all that you, you really get out of her. So right. I think that kind of says a lot. Mm-hmm. But, well, um, yeah. And I mean, even like the documentaries and stuff that you watch about the making of this movie, like she doesn't do any of, you know, they'll get the entire cast back, but she'll be, she won't be present. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, and she's busy too, but she's, she's great. I mean, she comes from the, the you know, the, the Arquette family, which there's many members of and, and Louis Arquette we've talked about here, Rosanna Arquette, uh, we talked about from our after hours episode was, was already around and uh but this we'll is the get first to David. one <laughs> we'll get to david arquette one of these days we'll get yeah we're we're, we're working our way through the arquettes <laughs> uh but yeah and we've got other you know we've got lawrence fishburne who was really not at this point was not a name actor either he'd been around he'd been in apocalypse now he'd been in you know uh, other movies but his what was the movie that made him a star? I just remember by, kind of like by the early 90s, he was just a, a star. He just kind of like appeared at the star level. It was, was, was it maybe still, Boys in the Hood? He was still Larry at this point. Larry yeah. Fishburne. Larry. Uh, yeah. And he, he was Cowboy Curtis on, on Pee Wee's Playhouse. You that's know, that's, right. that's what I'm going to always remember him as. Yeah. Before yeah. he was... Before he was on the Matrix, he was Cowboy Curtis. Yeah. And so watching the Matrix, I've never been able to not see Cowboy Curtis offering <laughs> offering the pill to Keanu Reeves. I think Boys in the Hood and and Searching for Bobby Fisher were probably yeah. the yeah. things that kind of established him were more at the at that point, you yeah. know, and then mm-hmm. wasn't uh, he mainstream. what's love what's love got to do with it too? Wasn't he yeah. um yeah. Yeah, I played like Turner. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, he had a nice, he started, his star started to really rise in the early 90s as he was going through. Prior to all those Oscar nominations, you know, he was, he was here working in the, in the hospital as really a side character with no real, I mean, his character had no real arc or depth or anything. He was just kind of there, was kind of the nice male nurse, right? Or Yeah, but you know, it's what's crazy is that you can already see the potential. I don't know if you do this when you watch films, you go back and watch movies and you know the actors will later go on to have a huge career and you can see it early on in the early films with the rest of the cast, especially in this film. He stands, even though he has no real point in this film, he just stands out as a good actor with what little airtime he has. It's he delivers it so naturally that as I was watching this, even rewatching it, I'm like, man, there's no doubt in my mind he was going to go on to become a successful actor because yeah. he's just got something about him. And you can give him a tiny little role like this, and he'll still like steal the scene when he's on camera because it's just he's that good. And so I, that was interesting to see that. Um, I don't know. It's like you could already predict that he was going to go on to do bigger and better things. I wonder if it also has something to do. I mean, he was in, you know, like. At this point, he had already had like roles in in a couple well known movies like Rumblefish and The Color Purple, you know, like things like that. I wonder if just seeing how those, like working with that kind of caliber actors and actresses around them, like also like up your game. So when you do come into something like this, like you're bringing a little, a little of that with you, you know, which kind of you know in turn brings everything up just a little bit. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you look at like his credits prior to this and, and everything, like he's got a bunch of movies that he had small roles in that were, you know, pretty well received, you know, award-winning or directed by, you know, obviously like 
pretty impressive directors, you know, Steven Spielberg mm-hmm. and whatnot. And so, who, you know, uh, you have you heard of him? He did a couple Who's movies. I, I know Steven Spielberg. Sp- Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah. Spielberg. Yeah. I'll have to look him up. But great films. Yeah, but I mean, I just I wonder, you know, like if that has anything to do to do with it, or 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 it, maybe he's getting those parts because of just that presence that you're talking about in this. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if he he raised the caliber of acting of those <laughs> around him in this film, but he did a good job. He did do a good job. Yeah. Uh, but if it had... stands out, you know what I mean? Like it stands yeah. out amongst those mm-hmm. others. Yeah, definitely. We had uh, Priscilla Pointer in this film, who uh, any of you Dallas fans out there, like myself, uh, she was a major character uh, on on that show, but uh, good to see her here. And then there's my favorite, and I say that sarcastically, Craig Wasson as Dr. Neil Gordon. I have always struggled with this character. He just drives me crazy. I don't know. I find him so annoying and I am, I'm just, I was baffled as to why they didn't kill him off. <laughs> What's your problem with Watson? I was, I was hoping for it. Dr. Neil Gordon, just not, in, not into him. Hmm. Yeah. You're going to have to, you have to kind of give us some more. You can't lead us. I mean, in like you mean, that you mean the trouble. doctor who's so easily convinced by the intern that he needs to prescribe this, this drug to to yeah. the well, the teenagers to get them the, to go the to young, sleep. The young pretty intern, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I What's mean, his he's problem? so easily <laughs> like swayed. He's like a, a complete pushover. But that 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 expression, that kind of like confused expression that's on his face every single scene in this movie, just range. Give me something more. It's like that look your dog gives you when you hide their treat. Yeah, like, like mm-hmm. what? What, how, why, why, why did you do that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about that character that I, and then, and, and I, re- I don't really know Craig uh, Wasson from too many other movies. He was in Body Double um, where he didn't bother me as much, but I, I don't think I've seen him in anything else besides this. So I'm kind of just locked into that. Hmm. Hmm. I don't well, know. You guys, he's a, you guys he's are like a hero. He was a, he's a hero of the movie. You're you're big Dr. Neil Gordon fans. He kicked ass. He changed no. his faith. Well, and that leads to he did, yeah. He uh, really did. He went an extra mile. Yeah. <laughs> he stole but, a cross, but he but then he then he later gave his license for it. It was like an IOU. <laughs> I have no money. I'm a doctor. I have no money in my wallet, but I can give you a license if you just give me this crucifix so he was an upstanding citizen he wears a dress <laughs> shirt pretty good you know he, he, he right. did he did you wear know? a dress shirt and slacks he had, he had well. good 80s hair good hair yeah. mm-hmm. he, yeah, he could funny. take a hit from a skeleton with a shovel i mean yeah he's, you know he did he a really good ser- one he serves no purpose really right like i mean does he no he, sa- he saved the day he, he does saved everyone he does yeah he is responsible for killing freddie really yeah but yeah, they he- could that could have easily been should have been well. Here's Lieutenant what sh- Thompson. Th- th- here's my Should've issue. Been. Here's my issue is so then then that leads us to who we do bring back from the earlier films, which is Heather Langenkamp and John Saxon as father, you know, father and daughter uh, Thompson. Really, like the hero from the first movie is back, and she doesn't quite get that hero role in in this. Well, the no. end, well not until the end. Right. I mean, she, I guess, finally steps up at the end, but I wanted to see, and it still bothers me. Like, I still want to see her be the real hero of the movie, not Dr. I, Neil. I think her role wasn't maybe to physically be the hero, but mentally be the hero. Like, she's the one that gives the children the power, the, uh, the power and the confidence to take on Freddie. And without mm-hmm. her, they had no adult believing in them and supporting them. So yeah. her role was central to the, the whole story because she's the one that brings them together, allows them to realize their potential in the dream world, and then you know uh, sees it through to the end. And I do like that they don't have her go on. I mean, they find a creative yeah. way to bring her back later on in the franchise, but I thought it was a really fitting end too, because there was really no need for her to continue on after this. I mean, 
without maybe a few more acting classes, she she really didn't need to go on any further. She's the Obi Wan yeah. Kenobi of the series. You know, she, she can let's, say, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, let's let, she, let's talk about. She sacrifices herself and yep saves the day. You know, it's I, a I good wish comparison, uh, Nancy <laughs> Nancy Thompson Obi-Wan. and Obi Wan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's good that they were able to have her hand the reins off. I I agree, and I mean, and she's it, always been. A little lacking and i don't know yeah I, well let's talk about that so it's always stood out to me also even when i saw it as a kid that the difference in the acting quality from the first movie to this one i don't know what happened because she was i like heather langenkamp i think she did a like she i think she did a good job in the first film i think she did a good job in the seventh film but in this one, something, I don't know if it was something off between her and Chuck Russell or just not jiving, but I mean, it's a very flat performance. I think that she didn't even want to do the movie, right? Like they they eventually like convinced her to do it, but it took a whole lot of like prodding. She had from what I gather from some of the research is that she had a bunch of other stuff kind of going on, you know, with family life and stuff like that. And she wasn't And just the 10 of us, maybe just the 10 of us was a little busy. Maybe, maybe, uh, but she didn't really have any interest in doing it. And she kind of begrudgingly signed on. But that being said, I disagree with, with what you say a little bit, John, like, I don't think she's really ever had super strong acting chops in any of the movies. I think, I think her delivery works in the first one because she's kind of, you know, just a little bit more of a, like playing what I think we're supposed to expect is like kind of a naive teen. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that her delivery kind of works a little bit better, you know, and then in this, like she's seems very similar in her cadence and delivery for everything that she did in the first one. It just doesn't play as well because she's supposed to be kind of more empowered. And I don't think, I don't think her delivery really plays that way. Well, I think she's also got less, you know, less notes to play as a character. You know, the character is much more flat in this. Oh, that's true too. You know, there's a, there's, there's a range for Nancy's character in the first film. So I think that's fair. Right. And, and, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yes. It's not, we're not winning Oscars for the, for the first film. And to be honest, Although, like I haven't gone back and watched new nightmare in a very long time, but I don't, I can't, I don't recall being blown away by her performance in that either. I feel like there should have been more range in this character because she's clearly been through a lot of trauma in her life due to the aged uh, hair streak they give her. Oh yeah. Because that, that's keep in mind, sure what is she like giveaway. in real life? She's like 19 or 20. Yeah. And so, but they're trying to make her seem like she's really, she's been through all of her coursework and everything. That's probably my favorite part is that when she shows up with her crazy adult hair and her mature <laughs> outfit yep. and they her give her this suit. really cheesy hair strike to make it seem like she's older than she is. Yep. That would indicate that she's really been through a lot. And so she should bring more to the performance, but yeah. it is flat. I mean, we can, we can make fun of her, but I do think that um, it does, it's distracting. I'll, I'll put it that way. It is oh, wow. a little distracting in several scenes when it's so flat and it seems there's no conviction behind a lot of the delivery that I, I'm noticing, I'm paying more attention to her inability to, to say the line than what the line actually was. And I don't really do that very often, but it's it's pretty noticeable in this movie. Right. This is a genre where we expect incredible performances by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's correct. Like, yeah. I think she, I mean, I think she was Nancy. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Like, just, yes, Nan- she's not, you know, she's not, uh, you know it's not a it's it's a flat performance so yeah i can sort of see that and all that but i mean it's just well, the thing is there's a lot of but the thing is this is a movie with a lot of talented people in it like that do mm-hmm. really well whereas like these other franchises were 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 talk about 
and like no one is good at any of them like at mm-hmm. all and then we Pretty sit there and that. stand out like oh that one person was like incredible like she was great like but based on what like what level of what standard are we putting for like the actors of these ensembles like, this is pretty like you know she's getting she's you know she, there's a lot of great talent here and patricia arquette stands out as you know really good like you know and and larry fishburne is great and i don't know i i, I like a lot of the cast in this and the rest of the kids and the kids are like the characters are designed to not just have like well they are sort of like they all have to have like one thing about them it's not like cheesy the way like like uh uh friday the 13th or halloween mm-hmm. put these like these like well this is that one character's thing and like whatever like like this movie like i can see why this is the the popular movie this is this is really good compared to like most of the the st- like everything you should compare it against like this is really good like yeah it, 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 the, the thing so the difference between the kids in this movie like yeah they all have sort of an angle and sort of yeah. like their thing but it doesn't come across it just to me it doesn't come across as too forced whereas yeah. in a lot of other horror well, they movies, don't feel stereotyped in the same yeah. way where it's like like dripping with stereotype like it's there like it's yeah. and it's not like it's hidden like it's a big part of who they are like the the kids the dungeon master i mean like yeah. you know like they don't ever shy away from it but just the way that it's played doesn't feel like you said as forced or as I think unnatural they, they, they feel like kids i guess in this you know yeah. that's when you have friends you always have that one who's like the nerdy D guy and the other one who dreams of superpowers in their when in their dream or whatever like that that's relatable and i think to go back you know i don't mean to come down so hard on her performance but i think what it is is david you're right we don't expect great performances in these kind of horror movies and that's the problem with this one is that everybody on a whole is actually doing a pretty good job so when you're not maybe doing a, a pretty good job and you're doing a normal horror performance it kind of stands out. It's like the inverse to a normal horror movie, whereas normally with an ensemble, everybody's a bad actor and you get one pretty decent one. With with this movie in particular, it's it's unusual because everybody's kind of doing a great job at what they're supposed to. So when somebody's not quite doing as good of a job, it actually stands out for that. And it's it doesn't happen very often, honestly. I mean, I feel like the acting in the first movie is pretty good too. I mean, mm-hmm. you got to remember, like she was acting against like Johnny Depp in the first one, and I mean, I just I and in even in that one, like I don't feel like she really. I feel like she gets outshined in that as well. You know, like I. I well, I yeah. I mean, you've got yeah, you've got a number of of pretty high caliber actors surrounding her. Even Amanda Wiss, I think, is great. You know, who was in tons of 80s movies and she's she's popular with me but um yeah. you know and you got johnny depp you got john saxon who's got a lot more to do in the first movie and and sure. the mother ronnie blakely and um yeah so well and and then let's not forget about robert england you know playing against a character who's especially in this one so high energy and so just a loud character um in in all the the best ways of that and you know so if you're not stepping up to that level that even the other kids i felt like were playing off of him you know in such an interesting way like she's just not quite there and and yeah i, I don't want to you're right i don't want to like continue uh yeah, ragging yeah. on her but. yeah what I did you guys just, think of, she did fine you, like she did what she i would just to say do. there's they gave her not, a lot to do i don't know i liked it I just feel like there's no power in her performance, I think is the thing that's missing. Like it's a good way to put it. Yeah. What did you guys think of of Robert England's Freddie compared to the two previous Freddies? Well, I'm personally, I'm a fan of the dark, brooding, more reserved Freddie from the first movie. You know, that's the Freddie. Like, I want the horror character and less of the MTV character. But, but he's like not he's not that interesting. He's just a he's just a 
a creature like he's, he's not terrifying even, but yeah like, he's not... just scary but like what's who cares like he's interesting so... through what what he can do and where he can find you and that, that's the interesting thing about it it's more the gimmick and less of him you know with one-liners well i like that he's like enjoying his his he's a sadistic killer like in this movie mm-hmm. like he's like you know i get it like the the whole origin of him and all that's like really dark shit like and that movie is dark and all that and he and he's not but like the thing is he's not even that like kind of like terrifying i kind of thought like these these kills were really good the uh, the, the practical effects were unbelievable like, 1987 like holy shit this is great stuff compared to like three years ago like this this, this stuff yeah. looks amazing anytime and, like, you can try to kill somebody as a penis uh <laughs> you know <laughs> well but what i mean that that, that, yeah. that design was great like that the the like it looked like i, I understand a penis shape like a or penis. whatever yeah. yeah all right all right but like you know like when you had his like big like head the, the eyes and the, the the shape of his face they had they had to do so many versions of his face whether it was like a claymation whether it was like in the shape of uh of other of other stuff and it's like they kept consistently making freddy look like freddy was this stuff like yeah this was like yeah. leaps and bounds like no wonder this is like a, a favorite oh, yeah. a favorite movie it's like it looks well, incredible the kills <laughs> the kills in the first movie are so violent and shocking and memorable yeah. in a very different way you know johnny yeah. depp spoiler alert uh, you know getting sucked through the bed and just gallons of blood shooting out oh, and with tina amazing. getting killed with the upside down in the room you know the set that was spinning around like those are just i mean those are amazing in a very different way here they're so creative and in kind of a fun way that this right. is where it really like we said like it really starts to get you're wanting to see the kills because you're wanting to see like oh like what are they going to do now how are they going to set this up and it starts with the first one is philip right where he he is playing you know he's the uh puppet master and he's like puppeteering yep. him oh, yeah, yeah. to basically oh, watching it this man. time when philip gets killed i i felt so just sad for him because yeah. he's it's so prolonged you know his like a, a lot of them it's you know within uh, you know a minute or two then like he's he's killed them or quicker than that you know for philip it's like he gets him you know he gets into his head he gets him up and then he drags him like using his veins as as you know the uh, strings like drag him all the way through the whole hospital up to the almost the roof and he's just like desperate and and helpless to get out of it i felt felt bad for the kid poor philip Oh, and I was disgusted by it. And I thought like, you know, but it was a well done. Like I hated it. But now oh, it was if, awesome. Fre- if Freddy was a penis as the puppet master, <laughs> would it have been <laughs> would it have been easier to swallow? I oh gosh. I yeah. you know what? I, going back to the Freddy though, let's talk about going back to the Freddy in part three versus one and two. Uh John, you said you liked the dark scary freddy part two better david likes the, the three Fred, freddy better i'm i'm gonna side personally with with david on this because i do think that the scary freddy from part two is it's creepy that he's dark and serious and creepy but there is something far more disturbing like disturbing and twisted about a, a killer laughing and playing with a child as a puppet and walking them up to like a bell tower and just dropping them off and like giggling and doing these animated scenes that it might not be as physically dark as part two, but it's way more psychotic when you actually stop and think about like, why is he getting so much pleasure from Mm -hmm. killing children? That to me is is much more disturbing of a killer than just somebody who kind of creeps in the shadows yeah. and you know pulls pulls their head off once in a while. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I won't um, argue with you like, guys. I think the movie's um, kind of scary. Like it's kind of it's kind of like this is kind of you know it's got a level of gore to it that's just enough, but it's like he's a scary dude. Like how oh, like he he comes up, you know, and like his moves are kind of like when you just have to engage with him physically, he's just slashing and this and that. But then he finds a way to like make it interesting. Um, I totally get like I you know I don't necessarily care for the one-liners um, because it doesn't those don't make me laugh that makes me like 
oh this guy's just enjoying this shit like that's i yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on the same boat of it's just like well and and in this one he's like using he's using information about the kids against them you yeah. know like yeah. he's using their best defense against them and that's yeah. truly the, yeah maybe the scariest part of it is that your your own personal best thing you can defend yourself with he's just gonna like tear right through that right yeah. i mean i personally feel like freddie from part three and four is like that's like prime freddie krueger as far as as far as like my thoughts on it go yeah. like i i agree like one is good and terrifying but when I think of Freddy, like I think of the Freddy from three and four. Yeah, I think like most that's, people do. That's yeah. that's who I like always kind of. Well, that was the most present k- kind of Freddy that we all. Right. That's who was out there and who was doing interviews and appearances and, you know, had a show. <laughs> but like his mask, he's, you know, he's so grotesque. And then you actually get a lot of like close up footage of him. Like where I think in the first two, you're not getting, it's always dark and you're not getting a good view of him for multiple and, reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so this is like, now you're getting like a great visual of him. You're letting him talk. You're letting him torture and letting him laugh about it. And it's like, Oh yeah. Like this is like, this is actually a character to be afraid of. Or like, if you're a child, like you might dream about Freddie, you have a nightmare. I was like, you know, yeah, Freddie, like sure. Jason, Jason and Michael Myers are just, just a bunch of losers who attack people like th- this guy gets into your dreams and messes with you like it's a it's like yeah he's like i get it man like Fred, this is it like this guy this part three guy he's cool <laughs> Give yeah, me I, do, I think jason I, and michael myers are pretty terrifying too but yeah, yeah whatever <laughs> yeah. they're just a couple I, of dudes i i appreciate that Although this is a very scary movie, we get, um, I don't think it was intentional, but we get nice moments of calm and laughter, like when John Saxon's ghost floats down into the room, (laughs) and I laugh so incredibly hard at that scene. Uh-huh. That it's like it's a nice little break from the the scary parts because I'm like oh thanks thanks for giving me a moment to catch my breath and and laugh at this ridiculous scene of a spirit dad floating into a room and, and for a brief second you're like oh wait it's like okay like he died like sure is, is that really him like you know I think that's- yeah well but, then- but there he's using nancy's like weak spot really that yeah. she's gonna let her guard down for one person that's her dad unbelievable good but yeah what he's doing i i think with you know i wonder with- he beats jason in the showdown <laughs> Doesn't he? Hey, he wins, right? What? Nah, I don't know about that. He doesn't win. Not I don't how remember. It's, uh, left with uh, at the end of that one, but he basically wins, though. No, Jason's got like of a Jason... axe or a sword. He's got a machete, right? Spoiler alert! Doesn't uh, he win? He goes in his dreams. J- and... It ends with Jason walking out of the lake, holding Freddy's head. Oh, so... dang! Okay, right, but then Freddy winks at the camera, so That's you know, right. of course, He's, it was all a dream. It was all it was all Jason's dream. <laughs> Freddie won the heart of America. So really, who is <laughs> who's the winner? Um, super cool. Yeah, super but cool, e- Freddie. Each of these each of these kills is is really interesting, and and I got actually it wasn't just Philip. All of them, I I got sad with each of them that you know the the dungeon master that like that's the only time he's out of his wheelchair and he's powerful and. He can has the courage to fight back, and it's just like, nope, Freddy's just gonna rip, literally, like rip your heart out. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, Jennifer was, Rubin too. You know, yeah, she's I was about like, to say, yeah. I'm, I'm beautiful and I'm bad, and then she gets her her moment, and that knife fight lasts like one stab. That's it. That's her big moment. Yeah. Whereas yeah. in part four, that's what I do like about part four is that. The kids get a little, or at least two of the kids get a little bit longer of a of a fight with him. This one, it's all this build up to like find your hidden power, and he's like, "Cool, I'm glad you found it. You're dead." Like, there's <laughs> yeah. no, he's so overbearing in the dream world in part yeah. three. Like, there's just no defeating him. It seems. Yeah, I think if you had that's what's awesome your... about part four in the Dream Master, though. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. The collection of all the powers. Well, it's like I think it's you learn from it. It's like, oh, I want to see more of like the kids fighting back, like the kids fighting back and being empowered and and all that stuff and Nancy inspiring him. And like that's 
what a great hook. And none of these kids knew each other until they had to come together. They're not like, you know, they're not all going to camp. They're not all in high school together. They're not all sleeping with each other. Like they're all like this, these, this disparate group of kids who all have their own issues on top of Freddie being a part of their, their, their <laughs> horror of life. And like, it, it's that, I think like it, it really like it, the script is so genius about that like making everything work like no, nobody has to have all these prior relationships it, there's like there's a couple there's like two different sexy moments in the movie you know one's very explicit and one's sort of that was a very you know, sexy moment you know but like it doesn't have to be about that either and like I, so it it's it's there's a lot going on in this for like instead of just like oh this one person's getting terrified and all her friends have to help and then all all the friends are getting in trouble and all, like like this really unlocks the key i think to making a really good version of this stuff like in terms of like attracting up bigger audiences like hands down david when you're talking about the sexy moments are you talking about the penis monster no no, no. <laughs> You guys seem obsessed with mentioning <laughs> No, it. John does. So hey, speaking, <laughs> speaking of the sexy scenes, John, since you said this awakened the inner uh, sexual desires of you, yeah. uh, have you seen the images of the original nude Freddy? It was just I, Freddy's head on a female body. It's the same actress, right? Who's just wearing uh, oh, the boy. Freddy head. And, I'm more attracted to that. I'm just curious about how that would have affected you as a child as that your first introduction to that would have, sexuality. Uh, that would have oh, screw, screwed me up a little bit. I was expecting that. I'm really glad I decided not to do that because it just it would be yeah. a little too much, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, as you know, a, a young young boy coming of age, and and like that was, you know, maybe a fantasy or you know, that was that was out there. Freddy? But um, yeah, yeah, Freddie, yeah. <laughs> Uh, with with the nurse, I mean, but um, you know, to have so to have that turn on what Joey was the character, yeah, right. Uh, Joey was, and he was, you know, a mute. And I love that she used the tongues as like as like the weapon that tied him to the bed as well. Right. I love the practical effects. As the bounds, the, the practical effects are so good. Uh, I mean, maybe the green screening isn't, but the the practical effects are really amazing, and the tongues even when they're not around him later, when they get taken off, they're still moving independently. Yeah. yeah. yeah and that's just such a subtle little incredible effect that is so effective. Like they'll always stand out to me. I remember as a kid being so disturbed by the tongue ties that uh, it was really clever. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, all the effects in the movie were really state of the art for 1987. Okay. Um, you know, Kevin Yeager did the the Freddy design for this one, which we'll see in in every Freddy movie. We're gonna see his care the look of his character change a bit, and this is probably the peak one where we're, that you were right, David. This is the first time we get a really good look at him, and it's really well done. Where it keeps, yeah. you know, this version is you know a scary looking, but you can also see what what he is going on with him. I think as we get in, I, I remember part five is probably being the, in my opinion, the the worst of the makeup effects for him, where his colors are off. He's, you know, got like dark eyes, but really pink skin. And just, he just looks so different from the, uh, from kind of the other iterations of him. Uh, but this one's, one's great. And then, and then uh, Mark Showstrom does the, did all the creature effects. So, you know, all of those, the tongues, the penis monster, the the uh, Freddy coming out of the TV, and um, you know uh, the the puppets, you know the puppet master, and and all of those gags all came from Mark Showstrom, and and were all you know effective because we're talking about them, we remember them so clearly, and they stood out. Did you see in the uh, the making of or the documentary? how they did that puppet effect. I thought that was really clever because I'm a huge fan of stop motion animation and claymation. And the way, you know, when his head is a solid form and then it morphs into the perfectly formed Freddy, which this is another thing, David, you're making a good point is that by getting to see Freddy for the first time, clearly, this is when we're gonna get the mask in Halloween stores after this, mm -hmm. because <laughs> prior to that, we didn't have a, a good look of him, but 
they're like trademarking the image in this film. Yeah. And so, you know, you get you get that face, but how they did it was in reverse. And I thought that was really clever uh, is that I thought that they were like forming it and photographing it until it was fully formed. But actually they did a series of heads in different states. And then they started with the fully formed one moved backwards and then played it in reverse so beautiful. that it like melted into his face. And it is so well done. Like it's, and this is before Puppet Master. Keep that in mind too. This is yeah. a couple of years before Puppet Master. So it, it was really impressive. And I'm going to be a sucker for any stop motion animation. Their Harryhausen homage, you know, in the, with a mm-hmm. skeleton. Man, I ate that thing up. That was, but, that's incredible, was incredible looking today. That looks incredible. When the skeleton is actually physically moving dirt with a shovel, I was like, this is blowing my mind right now. Yeah. So all of that was really clever because I think a lot of the attention goes to things like the tongues and the soles on the chest and all these like the TV oh, yeah. head. But there are other aspects like the puppetry in this that are just like stand out. I mean, it is yeah. really Kevin did an incredible job with this whole film. His whole team did. Yeah, I mean, they're 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 all really complicated. You know, they they come out they look great in the the final product, but those are all really complex things to do, especially again, in a lot of these effects in the eighties, they're just figuring it out as they do it. There was no blueprint of how to make a giant penis monster. Like it just wasn't, (laughs) it wasn't out there. (laughs) I'm pretty sure you had the blueprint, John. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Maybe a pink print. (laughs) Oh my gosh, we're gonna get an NC 17 rating. I'm just starting to realize that, like, you you like all these horror movies because there's a bunch of phallic phallic items being driven into other people's bodies. You're starting to figure it out. You're now starting to understand why you like all this. Nailed it, (laughs) not to shame you for your your gravitation toward uh phallic things. There's no shame in that. You do you, but but you know, a, a worm penis swallowing Patricia Arquette. And again, that face looked really good. Like yeah. it was horrifying. Like the hor- I understand, like there's the whole other thing of what you can associate, but like the eyes and the, just the shape of the face, like Absolutely. his eyes, yeah. his eyes are such an important part of how, how they feature him in all the shots because they're, like that's where the performance really lies with Robert England. England. Like his eyes are really part of it like and and on top of the design of the mask and the face like and i and it wasn't it wasn't that wasn't there a one before the worm where it's like his big giant head sort of and like you you get a good shape of his head and his like he's got like a the brow and his big eyes and it's like it almost looked entire, unless that was the worm i'm trying to remember but yeah, like, I can't. I th- I know. I think I know what you're. I think there was something right before the worm. But yeah, and it, and it was just like, wow, it's like it's a really good design of him, and it, and it may not even be his his actual face behind a mask. It's like a whole. I was just I like again like they took they had already they had figured out all of these things and then took the time and the budget to do it really well. Yeah. Like uh yeah and just yeah. Well, and, you know, and what I. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead I, I was just going to say, I don't know when this is in relation to Beetlejuice as far as what the, what the year is. Same you know, year, we get I think. The, yeah, we get the Beetlejuice head on the snake form too. The mm-hmm. difference is what makes this one terrifying, the standout scene is when the snake form worm thing grabs her and it's you see the full scale of it and then it lifts her up in the air mm-hmm. and like body slams yeah. her down. That was... I mean, it's, it's like violent. It's just so powerful and, and it looked like Patricia Arquette, like it, in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, it's just it, it couldn't have been, but it was you know, like if it, it, you bought it, it. It's like night and day between the Beetlejuice head snake, you know, th- which is really playful and goofy with the eyes going everywhere. This one is like going literally going for the kill, and it's so incredibly effective. And I think that every time I watch that scene, I'm always surprised at how aggressive that moment is yeah is the beetlejuice well, head on the snake though is that claymation or is that practical too like did they I that's thought claymation that was, yeah yeah um whereas you know yeah there's yeah so there's well, a difference there too 
and I and I kid about the snake monster looking like a penis, but that was a that was a thing that they were. Oh, totally. With. That, that first version was much more phallic, and they had to kind of go in and change some of the colors. And um, I, I, I get it though. Not, I, I get not, I get the jokes. <laughs> oh, do you? Okay. I totally get it, man. <laughs> totally get it. I I thought in my memory that the snake monster like had almost like a freddy sweater but maybe my i, I apparently i just made that up <laughs> that's sort of the G- beetlejuice Would have been snake, cute, though, though, you just it had stripes like the beetle yeah. it's almost like you're marrying the two maybe yeah um uh, but yeah they did have to kind of make some changes to have it look less like that so, so it was much more penis like in the beginning the original oh, yeah. one was like yeah, it was yeah sure. like they were like whoa we can't we can't film this. It was just flesh tone and all the more veins look yeah. like look, they look like veins. Yeah, and they're like, just, yeah. this is what you wanted. This is what you designed, and you like, asked for this. This is what we it. talked about, guys. <laughs> we had seven meetings about. This. Yeah, yeah. I think we've all been part of those. But um, circled must look like penis seven times. Really. Let, let's circle back to just some of the some of the story points. Um, you know, I think the setting for this movie was really kind of ingenious. I think it was the perfect place to, you know, if you're going to keep going back to, I think that's kind of uh, one of the downsides of the other franchises that they have to keep going back to the well, right? Like you keep going back to Haddonfield, you keep going back to Crystal Lake and you sort of have to for those movies, but here you don't have to go to Elm Street. It can really happen anywhere. And it makes, it's logical to me, like where this one is set. Oh yeah, I think so too. Man. Yeah, um, it's, it's brilliant. Well, I think the, it makes a lot of sense, and especially at that time, like apparently in the late '80s, they actually had a bunch of these like hospitals set up across the country where parents were sending their kids when they had troubled teens and stuff like that. So it's for the it's it's accurate for the for the for the time, you know. Topical, yeah, yeah, topical. And it allows, uh, it gives time for the story to unfold in a setting where they're not going to be believed. I think that's what I like too, is if if you create an environment where the kids right away, are, nobody's going to believe what they're saying because they're already in a psychiatric ward, that it allows Freddie time to manifest and start picking them off because by the time the adults wise up, uh, it's too late. And I think in a psychiatric ward or a mental hospital or whatever, that's a perfect setting because he's got ample time to just mm-hmm. start terrorizing these kids without well, anybody even taking anybody seriously. Well, and they're there because Freddie's already been tormenting them, right? Like he tormented them to the point to where they ended it's up. Hard there, to, yeah? It's hard no, to say like yeah. they, they're, they're troubled for, I guess, sort of unknown reasons for a lot of them. The only one we see is, is Kristen, right? Patricia Arquette's character. No drug abuse, uh, heroin abuse. Like we get, we get those things, but we get, we get the sense that once they're there, they start having problems sleeping. Well, but, but she went there. Like, I mean, Kristen went there because she was like, she slit her wrist. Yeah. Right. But like she slit her wrist in her house in a dream state brought on by yeah i, I right? think like it, the it's nightmare a little, she was having where the house and freddie was attacking right her, yeah it's it's a little bit unclear of like is it uh, does it get triggered when they hit a certain age that like freddie's finally finds a way into their psyche you know there's i think there is some creative question marks there that you know i, I don't think ever really get answered but um, See, yeah, I always it, kind of figured they were there because Freddie tormented them to a place where their parents sent them there and kind of had them all, all there together. Yeah, but I don't think they realize that it's Freddie until they're there. Oh, that like, might be that might be true. They I might think, not know what Freddie is until right. they're there, right? Like, I, I, I think that's that was what introduced it is that- by he's doing he's motivating these problems for them and and their their mental issues but they don't put it all together or realize that they're all kind of revolving around the same person yeah. until they're there together sure that makes and then sense. nancy just solidifies it like no this happened to me and you're all right and you're not crazy 
Okay. Which makes her character so incredibly important again. Yeah. Like this is what binds everybody together. You know, and to, then you to got, become the dream warriors. And then you but, got Dr. Neil, who's just there along for the ride saying, yeah, what she said. Feathering his yeah. hair. Yeah. Yeah. He- Heather's like Professor X and yeah. he's like Jean Grey, kind of like the <laughs> yeah. assistant. Maybe he's you know, just the but... wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he is the wheel, but the, like the big wheelchair from later in the movie. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you think about the creation of the the origin of Freddy Krueger here with the bastard son of a hundred maniacs that becomes uh, really hammered home over the next three movies? Yeah, it does. Oh, is that true? Is that a fact? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, a little that's that's a, that's a little tough. Uh, that's a little tough. Yeah, yeah, it definitely <laughs> comes back. Like it's a big through point and i don't think it's needed couple. either i mean i think i think having the not knowing one person like, yeah <laughs> yeah you, could just... have, you had one person like violently rape her but to have like oh no let's let's make it a hundred that'll be yeah. great a hundred psychopaths was... rape her like that yeah that's so like it, his like, mother little, his little mother tense. was a nun who was accidentally yeah. locked into an insane asylum like area she, with she many crazy young, people and she's like a young nurse or something right as they say yeah. like in the yeah and so she's raped by know. all of them and then is impregnated and that's what creates the evil that is freddy i kind of like it as a lore like if it's just a sort of a legend the fact that the we learn the fact that, that it's told from the, the mother's point of view well, like yeah and then they, we almost yeah. see it in i think part five where Hopefully. they really get into like we're gonna you know it's not enough that we told you about it we're gonna show you well like it could have just rested there if she didn't she wasn't in the movie and then what's his face like suddenly decides to figure out where she's buried or something right or like it just occurs to him and he runs off dr neil dr neil finds her grave and she's been dead for 20 years and it's like oh boy okay you didn't (laughs) You didn't need to do that, <laughs> yeah. but you're the mom. Was, like that's the cheesy <laughs> pretty part. Funny. Just you're his out. mom. You're There's his definitely mom. as the as the years go on, um, this film, this film of all of the nightmares used to be the one that was the the least campy, and my opinion has been changing over the years because especially this last watch, I found myself <laughs> laughing a lot oh. at some of the scenes were so over the top dumb that I. I couldn't decide if I no longer liked this film as much or if I liked it more yeah. because of how cheesy it was and things like that. The reveal of the, the grave was just, you know, the floating down of John Saxon. All these things are so funny to me. Um, but then at the same time, they're coupled with these extremely aggressive, violent scenes of the vein puppet and the, the TV and stuff. So the tone of this why I think people do go back to this as being the definitive one is this is the perfect mixture right here where you've got one and two, but then you've got four and five. And if you were to dilute both of those and put them in a little cup, you got part three right yeah. there. It's like, this is the, the delicate balance before it goes too far in one direction. And it had already gone too far in the other direction prior right. to this. So it is a, it's a funny mix of like truly terrifying but also like over the top cheese at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's like they had to they had to retain an element of of <laughs> of like or like they wanted to establish this element because like, like I don't of of cheesiness that goes mm-hmm. a little bit too far because yeah. otherwise it's just like sort of a straightforward kind of thing. But you know, yeah, his one liners are it's the one liners that are cheesy. This establishment of, of his mom who's a ghost nun who's dead. <laughs> like and I, but i i have to say like the the saxon coming floating down like an angel like that you gotta that's that's freddy doing that yeah like that's yeah. freddy being like he's funny it's me Freddy is the character he's a psychopath it's and he's yeah. enjoying it but you which, would hang out with freddy i'd hang out with freddy yeah like i'd have to you know but and like and i understand like the idea of like a there's nothing that i I I don't really care for like lots of just indiscriminate murder and anything. This was fine. This was great. Like this, like all, 
this movie solves the problem of of Dave Munchak, like of not liking this <laughs> shit. Don't know why. And it, and it moves so well. That's the other thing about part three is the pacing is so fluid. Like yeah. I can get through this film and not even look at the clock. I'm like, oh, I guess yeah. it's, it's already over. It is really well paced. So credit to the script, I would say, and the editing really is like, it just moves along really, really well. And that's something that maybe doesn't happen. And especially by the time we get to, to five and six, it's it, they drag on a little bit. There's yeah. there's scenes that I'm like, when is this going to be done? But three, man, three from the moment it starts, the moment it ends, just as it's a ride. You're not you're not waiting for the next scene. Yeah. He, Six he, was the three D one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the that final Dream master. No. Nope. Uh, what's Dream Master? We, well, well, uh, down four. the road we've Dream got Masters Dream Masters four. Dream Master. Then Dream Child. Dream Child. Freddy's dead. And then. New nightmare, New nightmare than Freddy versus. Than Freddy versus I think start to finish number five then is my my first start to finish. Again, I think I, I've seen a lot of this movie, but I think start to finish number five was the one I sat down and watched with friends. Ooh. Dream first, Child, Ooh. yeah, tough one. Boy, that's a that's a hard. One. That's a yeah, yeah. That's that's not the right one to watch yeah. first. Yeah, no. I mean, I was just, I don't I don't really I don't even think I cared too much for it at the time. Yeah, I wasn't. It's like but, the, it's like the third of this like little trilogy franchise. Yeah. It's three, four, and five a are a trilogy. It, it's the the Kristen right the Kristen trilogy transitioning yeah. mm-hmm. into Alice. Isn't well, it's Alice the, the it's lead? the it's the dream yeah. Tr- trilogy. Yeah, yeah, the dream trilogy. Um. So one here's here's one thing that you know in hindsight if I were making this movie what I would have tweaked at the end so you know we Fewer we penis. reveal Lieutenant Thompson is now I what we assume is like a security guard that and and a drunk mm-hmm. that he's you know feeling so horrible for you know what he's contributed to the whole Freddy situation all these people dying his ex-wife his daughter being messed up and all of her friends and getting killed. And um, so when they bring him, finally motivate him to do something, wouldn't it have been kind of cool or is it too cheesy if she's fighting Freddie at the same time that instead of Dr. Neil fighting Freddie, you know, Freddie should have just chucked Dr. Neil to get skewered in the junkyard. And yeah, Lieutenant Thompson could have had this dual fight. The Thompsons oh, are yeah. both fighting Freddie at once. hundred percent. And then, and then Lieutenant Thompson gets his redemption for all the bullshit. Exactly. By, oh yeah. A hundred percent. He gets, he gets eliminated in that fight immediately. I mean, John yeah. Saxon, just like, here's his big moment and boom, skewered dead. Yeah. And he dies. A, he dies a coward. He dies yeah. being called out, trying to sneak yeah. away. And he's yeah. like, looking for these and holds up the keys that yeah that did no justice to that character who has been through everything he's lost his entire career and his family's fallen apart like give that guy some sort of ending and instead you you give it all to this other guy and you just kill off this what was the even point of bringing him back if that's how you're going to end his legacy is like just a coward yeah it was but maybe you know maybe that is the point maybe that it's not everybody is a hero but I, I can't believe that he would have gone out that way. Yeah. yeah. It seems like he would have stepped up to the challenge. Yeah. Seems like a missed opportunity. You know, I, yep. yeah, I feel like, yeah. I mean, look, they, they had a lot going on on this one. It probably just at the time just didn't, didn't really uh, come across their radar to, to go the other direction with it. But, but looking back at it now, like it's, it's very, very clear that there was an opportunity to do something more. And then it just would have had, an even deeper kind of, you know, theme going on there. Yeah. And yeah. even if it, like you could still kill both of them, but they've been re- both, each of them redeems themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you still have to kill both of them. And I think that that's fine, but like yeah. they, cause where are you going to go with those characters after this? You know, then, then it's like they get, if they live, you know, they have their happy moment and that's it. Or, you know, what, where do you go? I don't I know. I think, I think the dad survives and then he marries Kristen and then, then <laughs> they have a dream child. Oh, that's... hot take. <laughs> and, she, and she dreams about giant penis monsters. <laughs> exactly. Oh gosh. I think their age discrepancy is too much, even for yeah. the, like, I, yeah, your age plus seven rule or whatever that is. Yeah, yeah that she's like even much younger than Nancy. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess that's I guess that wouldn't work. Yeah. Uh, um, Patricia Arquette was only 18, I think, at the time of this filming. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, she, and she's probably playing 16. Or yeah, whatever. 18 to look younger. That's, but wait, that's... so I don't want them to get married. They, you know, I didn't mean that. I'm not even thinking of her age. Because <laughs> all these kids are 28 <laughs> like, or whatever. <laughs> right. In real the life. Actors, yeah. Of, like, yeah well, some of them. Yeah. You know, it's funny. The dude who plays Will in the wheelchair and all that. Yeah. I thought he was... Uh, Chris Demetrol or Demetrol, who mm. was the kid, he was the son on Dream On, but who I remembered him from. Sometimes they come back and you play the mm. character Wayne. Yeah, I, I know love, what you're talking about. I love that two parter. That was great. Sometimes they come back was awesome. I'm a big fan of that. And so, but he kind of looks like him behind the glasses. But Chris mm. Demetrol is like ten years younger than the guy, uh, the Ira Heldon who played. Uh, yeah. Who played well. But they had oh. sort of a similar kind of vibe, but he was like 22 or something like that in the in the filming filming uh, Nightmare Three. So we end up with we Freddy doesn't quite kill all of the Elm Street kids. We have what three survivors? It's true. Four, four. Oh, Wait, we know who's... three. No, no, three. Yeah, yeah, three. We've got Joey, we've got Kincaid, Joey Kincaid, and then um, Kristen. 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 Yeah. yeah. Who starts the whole film by calling them back into her dream in part four? Right, like he, right. So they, she, so they all come yeah. back in part four to, well, to all be killed. In the beginning. You should, I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, yeah, some some characters return for part four. Do all of them, or just some? Joey yeah. and Kincaid are back. We have a different actress playing uh, Kristen. Patricia Arquette was, but the was big time at this point. I see. And we have an incredible. Part four does start with a really amazing like reintroduction of Freddy. So hopefully uh, part four is covered down the road because oh, yeah. oh it will. That, the one thing one, that I do one year love, from now. Yeah, next yeah, October. I what I do love Set is your the calendar. continuation. You know, if you are if you watch part four, it picks right up off of part three yeah. in the junkyard. And I love that because I oh, hate really? it. I hate that going from part two <laughs> to part three is is clunky. It's it's like oh, yeah. where are we now? Who is the who are these people? Whereas three to four is just seamless. You can watch them yeah. back to back. Yeah. Wow. They're meant to be watched back to back. Yeah. So and, exactly. And four and five really are more of a pairing than I think even three and four are. Yeah. I yeah, yeah. I could see that. Uh, Rennie Harlan directed part four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, after doing prison, there's a film that's pretty interesting if you haven't seen it. Uh, yeah, that, early Viggo, that was... Viggo Mortensen uh, is in it. It's got yeah. some great practical effects. Uh, it's pretty cool. Haunted prison, prison. Prison was his first gig, right? That was. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll get to that next year. Yeah. Yep, we that's will. coming. We will. That's coming. Plenty to talk about. Um, yeah, but Roach yeah, motels so... and everything to talk about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about a little box office glory here. All right, so the movie comes out. You know, this is there's a lot riding on this because if this if this Nightmare on Elm Street fails, that's probably it for the franchise and most likely the end. But if it's successful, then they really could have something going. So. And New Line, you know, I don't remember exactly what New Line's lineup was uh, here in the mid '80s, but it's definitely, you know, it's famously known as the house that that Freddie built. Um, so this was really important uh, for their longevity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so okay, the movie is uh, the budget is five million dollars. It releases on February twenty seventh, nineteen eighty seven, against some kind of wonderful. So perfect pairing two movies that couldn't be more similar <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe this was made even in 87 on five million honestly with that degree of practical effects yeah like, well right? that's a, a lot of it right there yeah that's really impressive yeah and uh craig wasson's high uh high salary hairspray. I'm sure. his hairspray and, yeah his hairspray <laughs> Um, it opens up at number one ahead of Platoon, which was in week 11, uh, Outrageous Fortune, and our other favorite movie, Mannequin. Hey. Hey. Oh, yeah. Mannequin. 
We can love that movie. Yeah, um, too. that's a good yeah. one. It, uh, if you want to hear us go on and on about Mannequin, check it out in our archives at reconcinemation.com. Uh, it had an $8.8 million opening weekend and a $44.7 million domestic run. So that's a, that's a big hit for a $5 million budget. That's a massive success. Yeah. That's would, huge. Yeah. That must have ran all summer, right? It, that probably just... Well, yeah, know. February. It probably ran throughout the spring. Um, but back number, then, movies lasted so long. You know. Yeah. I mean, you could run in a theater for almost six months, really. Home Alone, you know. 13 months. Yeah. Uh, it ends up number 23 of 1987, right between Full Metal Jacket and The Last Emperor. So two, you know, Oscar wow. level movies just yeah. wrapping right around Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. Wow, that's impressive. 23. I, yeah. Uh, this, let's, you know, go this ahead. is what solidified it, though. I mean, I, I, yeah. could you imagine what they were thinking when the numbers started to come in? Because two was expected to flop also, you know, uh, historically sequels don't do as well as, as the first one and two completely eclipsed the first one. So this is building on that trend. And although looking back on it in retrospect, you go, well, that makes sense. Of course, it's going to be more successful. He's becoming a household name, but nobody thought that when this came out, I think mm -hmm. they, they thought right. they had a cool film, but I think that they were hoping at best to match the you know the turnout of part two yeah well and then coming off of the you know uh, yeah yes two was successful financially but word of mouth was not as kind so right. i think there was a real worry that base you know we we really looked at that with our, our friday the 13th films is that they're really what happens in one movie is greatly going to affect the next one so yeah. with this one there was a big worry whether it was going to work or not, but they had a really smart marketing campaign. You know, they, they hit the right age, you know, the right demographic really hard. They worked the dock in MTV angle, you know, and, and like me seeing it in, in cracked magazine, you know, that, that kind of exposure uh, was really, was really key. And I was too young for the movie or we all were, but you know, we're going to find our way to see it anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, where if you look at the French, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, this one's kind of almost in the middle, financially speaking. You know, obviously, your more recent films are going to have bigger box offices. So the, the 2010 remake uh, is is number one, Freddy versus Jason's number two. Uh, number four, Dream Master is the third ranking. And this one lands in at number four. Hmm. So which, you know, all that makes sense financially when exactly what we were just talking about. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And, and you know, thinking about that, the seventh film, which would be coming off of Freddy's Dead, generally known as the worst of the movies, is the lowest ranking uh, box hmm. office score. He had lost the shine. Hmm. Yeah, he lost oh, it was definitely gone by that point. Shine and and, and the, why we... We rarely saw Freddy after 1994. You know, he's really very much an 80s character who is probably at this point, seeing what they've done with the Halloween franchise, probably ripe for a retelling with the right, you really got to have the right writer and the right performer playing Freddy Krueger. Yeah. It's going to be a tricky one because unlike... Michael Myers or Jason, who are all hiding behind masks and are just bodies. Uh, Freddie is always going to be linked to Robert England. And yeah. so yeah. that's going to be problematic. I mean, look at even Pinhead. They've tried multiple times. Doug Bradley was Pinhead. And then when they, they've given it to three, four actors since then, the most recent being a female Pinhead now. And it's Ooh. just... They're trying and people are, you know, actually the, the one right before it wasn't that bad, but nobody is going to see Pinhead as anybody other than Doug Bradley. And I think even more so when Freddie had oversaturated pop culture market as being Freddie the actor, um, I, I just think that that's, that's gonna be a, a tough one because they tried it once 
and it failed miserably mm -hmm. and it and it's it all hinged on the right actor this is one of those characters where when you're six seven films in with one person you can't just go uh hey spoiler we got a new guy now it's you either yeah, end the right. franchise or you bring that guy back. I gotta say though, Jackie Earl Haley, that sounds like perfect casting when at before you make the movie. Like if someone's gonna replace him, Jackie Earl Haley, he's he's you know, he's got a certain look, he's got a certain, you know. I, yeah, I don't vibe. think it was his performance that was so bad in, in the twenty ten, but it was more of the take on the story and the character. I hadn't seen it, yeah, but I, that I, but on paper it just sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Yeah, that didn't help. But then again, like as soon as you start watching it, even I mean, anybody who was a fan of the franchise back in the 80s, you know, like it, it's not going to resonate very well. Yeah, I, know, it, because Robert England is such a huge component to why Freddie is what he is, you know, I, I think it's eventually going to happen. Uh, I think I think we'll see Friday the 13th get a big reboot first before before we see Nightmare on Elm Well, Street. we have they settled all the legal stuff with that because that's the only Sean, thing holding that up, right? Sean Cunningham tweeted out a couple of weeks ago that we are going to see a Friday the 13th film next year. Oh. And I okay. love the remake of that so, one. Talk about remakes. I, I, do that, I love that one. I thought too. that remake was incredible. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess with the Freddy one, though, that's different from Friday 13th is it's like when Queen, you know, uh, when Freddie Mercury died and then they, they get Adam whatever to, to be the lead singer. Yes, he's got an incredible voice. No different than, yes, this actor is incredible in the role of Freddy, but it's not Freddy. And I think yeah, that right. that's the problem. If they can figure out how to resolve that in the minds and hearts of fans who grew up a generation knowing one actor playing this guy, if they can figure that out, they've got a hit on their hands. If they well, can't, though. And uh, what about gonna, just bringing Robert England? I was about to say, like, That's, Robert England's around and he's still able to, you know, he's capable of performing. And, and there's a way to, you know, obviously, if you're going to do really physical stuff with that character that's an easy stunt double at this point you know with makeup effects now i mean they're incredible like all the the various you know from from k and b to legacy effects to you know alec gillis and all these people that are out there that are just incredible um you could you could do a lot i mean or he just having... popped up in the latest season of stranger things i'm yeah. sure that that's gonna start Feed, stoking uh, that fire or you have an elderly freddy I, play that angle yeah Let's just have freddy's a as long as as long as there's a penis monster we're we're good to go but also like this, this the fans have to be a, demand it this would have to be a little harder to the do. fan I, I didn't see the remake but like part of freddy's appeal was this post you know movie number three you know like he's the, he was accessible for the mtv generation and with his with his lines and all that so like you kind of like you can't be all dark and you can't be yeah. all cheesy yeah. and you need a performer to 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 marry it all and make it appealing he's very complicated to redo <laughs> like yeah. i don't know because yeah you know he's just child. think all the tiktok jokes like the, the before he became freddy krueger he was a guy named fred krueger who murdered children he was then, Fred Krueger. Yeah. And Fred. then, yep. and then, which is a great story, is all the parents murder him. And, and like, that's, that's a great idea. That's such great lore and all that. And then he's a dark, sinister guy who's back. And then he becomes a cheesy pop culture icon. And then people like love that. And then, how do you, where do you go? Like, how do you redo the whole thing? There's so much baggage. Like, there's there is, and there's a lot crazy. of there's a lot of ways you can go that you know you make it you know really push the psychological anger you know angle. Uh, you could do that. I don't know. You could do a number of things, but it's it's tricky, much trickier to make this reboot work than it would was Halloween or Friday the Thirteenth. I think you you kind of have yeah. to honestly. It's like Deadpool, right? Like Deadpool's funny. He's also a straight up murderer with a lot of baggage and they don't 
harp on that and then he's just and then when you see him in movies and whatever he's killing bad guys more or less so yeah. he's not killing but like again like you almost have to just separate the child murder part like make it make it maybe he is out for revenge because he was mistakenly killed like i think you i think you alter his story and then he's like all right well i'm just you all think i'm a murderer i'm just gonna kill your kids and i'm gonna enjoy it and like you take that part out i think you maybe i think you get like a character that at least you can watch murder a bunch of innocent kids like mm -hmm. you know teenagers played by 20 year olds i think i could watch that version of freddy but him being the actual original origin like i don't know i don't know how you do it again yeah <laughs> like, to make it interesting to be a, i'm not a writer but i just you know i'm just saying like what do you do you really want to see that guy again do you want to see the guy who whose history is like he killed children and was originally a pedophile murderer <laughs> like yeah the pedophile I, slash I know. child murderer i don't want to see that i don't care about yeah. that guy well it would know, be just... interesting to get another take on it though because the last one they tried was not very successful they tried to go too serious that was the problem is they yep. tried to really play the serious card of like take all the camp out of it take all the one-liners take all the light-hearted humor and make it absolutely like a drama almost mm. of this dark dark figure who is just a horrible creepy person and that was too much that was everybody yeah. was like whoa 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 that's yes he's creepy but we don't need to know that like it yeah. doesn't need to be that serious that's where their misstep was is that they they took it way too far in the other direction gotcha. trying to correct Maybe. trying that's to correct the, you know five and six or whatever yeah. right but, but they they missed the point of freddy Maybe you're onto something, David, with uh, Deadpool. Maybe you just get Ryan Reynolds to play Freddy Krueger. <laughs> we should get Jordan Peele to make the new Elm Street. I don't know. Get <laughs> get get the new master. Pitch of it, David. You got to pitch it. Hold we'll, we'll give Jordan a call. So, uh, all right. So, part three comes out, massive hit. Uh, that's going to, of course, lead right into part four, which which uh, goes into production almost immediately and is released, I think, only a year later in 1988. So, you know, this dream trilogy is back to back to back. So 87, 88, 89. And we're going to get into those down the road. And of course, it's a standing open invitation for our dear friend EK to join us on that journey. Uh, <laughs> I'll gladly come back for four. Yeah, he's absolutely he, yeah. definitely back for four, right? Yeah, for sure. I can talk about four all day. Yeah, well, it's going to be fun, and and uh, and we've got a great rest of our. This is just the beginning of Shocktober here. We've got another special guest coming up on our next episode, and uh, followers followers of our podcast probably know what we're doing towards the end of the month of October. Uh, what what film we'll be taking a look at <laughs> so that's going to be interesting but uh yeah i just i uh, just want to say thank you to ek for coming on as we kind of wrap things up and um you know plug up plug away for laser graves and tell us where where, where everybody can find uh find your podcast um well first off thanks for having me again this has been a blast i know i was hard on heather but um you know, you got to tell it like it is sometimes. That was my only criticism. But I also, speaking of plugs, we didn't even mention, and we can't get into it now because the show's over, but <laughs> this was also a big standout uh, for Angelo Badalamente, my all-time favorite film composer. This was his big moment right after Blue Velvet. So this really started his career right after Blue Velvet. And he did an incredible job. So at a, at a later time, you know, maybe in part four we can do some some looking back on the the composers over the over the different franchises because Christopher is, Young did part two. Yeah, I mean it's and these are like well powerful powerful composers. You're you're a hundred percent right, actually, and we should talk about it just for a quick second. That 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 oh gosh, there was I mean such a such a change in score for each of these movies that you know you had your sort of really like iconic theme music from the first movie that is abandoned and then like you say christopher young and then angelo battlemente with a legendary career uh kind of getting kick-started here yeah i just wanted to point it out because he you know he was in his 40s at this point like he didn't have a film career he just did blue velvet the year before and the very first like phones rang off the hook 
and right after Blue Velvet. And the very first call he got was Nightmare on Elm Street Part Three, and he took mm-hmm. it. So wow. this this is part of a really interesting history of his career because he would go on to be an incredible composer. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there because we didn't get to him. But that's yeah, no, when, thank you for doing that. You know. Even though three isn't my favorite of the franchise, I'll always have a special place in it because Angelo Battlemente scored it. And so I'm always going to love it because of that. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. Well, yeah, you can find me on um, Instagram over at Laser Graves, our show. And we're at lasergraves.com if you want to check out any back episodes. We're doing it every two weeks. We do a new episode and having a blast. So, you know business as usual just <laughs> going forward just keeping our head down and getting through them and can can you tease anything coming up in the next few weeks that that we should be looking out for uh we well we just did a big research episode so we're not doing that we're on the fence of if we're going to do a halloween episode or not we don't know yet mm. but we've got some fun ones lined up that's about all i can say but okay. they they'll be really fun we've got a, we're in a position that's a good position to be in where we've got too many things we want to discuss versus not knowing what to discuss. So nice. that's a <laughs> good spot to be in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brent, awesome. David, what about you guys? Any any, any final thoughts on uh, Nightmare 3? You guys recommend it? Should people watch it if they haven't seen? I absolutely think people should watch it if they haven't seen. Yeah, give it a shot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, this of the first three movies... This is the best one. Like that's it, hands down. One, two, three, three, <laughs> three, one, and two. That's the order. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Court is adjourned. <laughs> All right, you heard Munchak it from out. David. <laughs> Munchak dropping yeah. the mic. Yeah. Um, what do we? Yeah, guys I think? would agree. What, do I, I, what order I, do you put them? I think that three is a strong contender for for the best one. I still tend to like. Uh, I mean, we haven't gotten to four yet, but I like. You know, it's like. One and three are pretty pretty close. Four is still probably my favorite of all of them. But we'll talk more about that in a year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I uh, I think you should definitely watch Nightmare on Elm Street three. Yeah, I think I think anybody any fan of the franchise or potential you know fan of it should should take a look at this one. Like we discussed, this this is really the the, the right mixture of horror and the pop culture side and the right mixture of, of the Freddy as a character and the film as a whole. So um, yeah. I think for me personally, I still like one. So it's one, three, two at this point. Oh, That's just good. Understandable. Um, but yeah, it was EK. It was great having you. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We're always excited to have you back and, and hopefully we can get you back here, you know, before Halloween rolls around next year. Let's, let's, uh, it's been too long already so i'm yes. always happy to come on it's always an, an honor and i love it and we've been doing this for like literally years now so i know <laughs> we're veterans now. it's really fun yeah, yeah. Awesome. hundreds of episodes which uh all of which you can find in our archive at reconcinimation.com or you can find us on social media we're at reconcinimation podcast on twitter and instagram and and facebook uh and a uh, quick shout out to curtis moore thank you for the poster as usual And we are going to have a fun Shocktober. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next time on Reconcinimation. Take care. Bye now. Is there a sound bite of a large penis monster? I don't know if there, there is, is now. We'll, we'll make one. <laughs>